Good afternoon. My name is Brian Lecander, Program Officer with the United States Department of Education's Investing in Innovation, or I3 program. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Strategies for Scaling Up Education Innovations. Next. Next. Our objective today is to share with you some of the lessons that have been learned about scaling educational innovations by the I3 grantees. We're going to hear directly from two of these grantees who are going to tell us about their projects and how they approach the challenge of expanding the reach and impact of their projects. But we'll also share some general observations about scaling culled from the experiences of a slightly larger group of grantees. And we'll have some time at the end for general discussion and questions. Next. Our panel today includes Joel Zero, the CEO of Children's Literacy Initiative, Lindsay Wood Jeffries, who's the CEO of Higher Achievement. Both of these individuals are representing organizations that have received I3 grants to scale their innovative K through 12 education pro projects regionally or nationally. We're also joined by Tom DeWire, the principal of EdScale LLC. Tom's been working with Westat, which is contracted by I3, to provide technical assistance services to I3 grantees. And Tom has been leading the efforts to help I3 grantees with sustainability and scaling issues. Next. Next slide, please. Let me begin uh, by introducing you to some key features of the I3 program and its interest in scaling. The I3 program is devoted to the idea of evidence-based grant making. It began in 2010, and since then we've made about 172 grants, most of them for four or five year project periods. In I3, we have three different types of grants, development, validation, or scale up. The development grants aim to foster new innovative practices that solve persistent challenges in K-12 education, particularly aiming to improve the achievement of students with the highest needs. Those applicants who can provide evidence of effectiveness can qualify for validation or scale-up grants. And these grants require grantees to expand their practices to new sites, either regionally or nationally. Of the 172 I3 grants, we've made 43 validation and nine scale-up awards. So it's 52 total grants that have had as their focus scaling. All of the I3 grantees also conduct research studies as a condition of receiving funding. So it's an, impor it's an important goal of I3 to build new evidence of effectiveness on the practices that are receiving funding and to promote a stronger relationship between evidence and practice. We think scaling the process by which educational practices reach more students in greater numbers of schools and districts, it should depend on good evidence. We need to determine how well an innovation works, how it works in a variety of contexts, uh, and do that before widespread expansion. Too often, however, even when innovations are effective, educators don't know how to grow their projects in order to achieve this widespread impact. Um, too often, even the best, most promising innovations fail to grow beyond their original implementation sites, or at best, spread only a small number of new places. Next slide. Consequently, uh, we and I3 asked our technical assistance providers at Westat to help us explore what grantees have learned about the scaling process. And the result was this white paper, which you can see on the screen, Scaling Up Evidence-Based Practices, Strategies from in Investing in Innovation. You can find that at i3community.ed.gov. It was written by one of our panelists today, Tom DeWire, uh, and a couple of his colleagues. And we asked them to uh, find out what scaling strategies are likely to be most successful, what it takes to get consistent results across diverse sites, what role evidence plays in scaling, and what are some of the conditions that it would, would most contribute to sustainability. So now it's, it's time to dig in. Um, we'll begin by first learning more about each of our two featured projects. Uh, then we'll discuss scaling a little bit with each of the, uh, the two project directors that are with us here today. Uh, then we're going to hear from T 
from Tom, who's going to share some of the general observations that came out of the white paper. Uh, and finally, we'll have some um, general open uh, question and answer with, with you, those of us who are participating. But I'm going to turn it over now to Joel Zero from Children's Literacy Initiative, and he's going to uh, tell us about uh, their project and how they've approached the challenge of scaling up uh, their innovation. Joel? Joel, I think you might be on mute still. You got to hate that. What I was saying was, thank you, Brian. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast. You're all looking well. Um, I'm going to begin by giving a quick overview of Children's Literacy Initiative, CLI, um, a brief review of our results from the validation grant, and then jump into our strategy to scale. So next slide, please. Our approach or our theory of action is pretty straightforward. We um, believe that effective teacher support will yield great instruction, which will then improve student learning. So the question then is, what counts as effective teacher support? And we focus on three primary areas. Um, the first is providing one-on-one -on -one embedded coaching to teachers. Um, for all of our projects, we provide a minimum of 25 hours of coaching per teacher. Um, in the validation grant, it was a bit more than that. Then we provide workshops and institu institutes for teachers. So what are the building block skills for early literacy and what are the effective instructional practices to build those skills? Uh, we take a balanced literacy approach. And then we provide books and materials for classrooms. So how do we give teachers and students what they need in order to be effective at, at, at reading and writing? So great quality books, rugs, uh, whiteboards, what have you. We also pay attention to grade level meetings and leadership team meetings and some other supporting structures. But those three elements are really the core of what we do. We received a validation grant in 2010 uh, that ran through 2015. We now have a scale-up grant in 2016. But for validation, just to give you a sense of who we worked with, we were in Chicago, Philadelphia, Camden, New Jersey, and Newark, New Jersey. If you could go to the next slide, please. We take that theory of action, and that really was the foundation for the evaluation. Let's look at each of those components of that theory of action. So. Did we do what we said we were going to do in terms of providing effective teacher support? And we're all green on that. No small feat to be able to have fidelity of implementation when you're working in large urban environments. Uh, there was superintendent turnover, principal turnover, teacher turnover. I don't need to tell you all of those paying attention to this webinar know what it's like to work in urban environments. Did our teacher support translate into great instruction? Again, all green there. We reached statistical significance with a pretty healthy effect size in terms of teacher practices and classroom environment. Then did, were we able to effectively build the bridge between great instruction and improved student learning? And it is a yes there, at least in two grade levels, in kindergarten and second. Um, with a decent effect size, given it was focused on student learning. In first grade, we just missed the mark in terms of statistical significance. Um, there's a broad range of learning skills, as you know, in terms of reading, and we really need to, we're, we're paying a lot of attention to heightening our practice in first, based on this evidence. So now let's turn to the next slide, and I'll describe the growth we've had. So I mentioned in 2010 is when we received the validation grant. It ran through 2015. You could see the revenue growth from 14 to 17. We've more than doubled in size. It's 141% growth. Our staff growth has been equally significant. Um, the yellow line below uh, is broken out because it really relates to one project in Philadelphia. The blue line is our FTEs as a staff. 
we've had increased traffic in our social media, and we've had geographic expansion. So we're now in Denver, Houston, and Broward. In validation, you see those four other cities um, that we're, we're working in. I wanna return quickly to the revenue growth. Um, while revenue grew, it's both the client dollar, the district dollar, as well as the philanthropic dollar. And I really use that as a stand-in for um, increasing our ability to, to reach more kids. It's a heuristic. If we could go to the next slide, please. So in terms of our strategy to scale, we take a seed to scale approach where in validation and now in scale up, we're using the same approach where we take the I3 funding and we consider it seed funding. And to seed a new operation in the four districts you see in the potted plant. For scale up, it's now Broward County, Denver, Elizabeth, New Jersey, and Houston. That seed funding enables us to create a local presence. So we believe that education and philanthropy, quite honestly, are local sports. We need to know the communities, we need to know the players, we need to build relationships. So when you come to a potential new partner and you say, listen, we have some federal funding, do you wanna play with us? Here are our past results. It's a lot easier to get a yes than if you have to go on and say, and it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars. So we're able to form that relationship uh, in seven schools, six schools, depending on the district, and build those relationships at the district level, begin to create proof points that we take people on walkthroughs in, and build the local philanthropic support. From there, we're then able to expand within each of the districts that we're serving. And that worked in validation as the prior data show, and we're beginning to show effectiveness in terms of scaling uh, it's early now, this is our first year in the scale-up effort, but we're already talking about expanding our impact in the new districts that we're serving, both from a district investment and a, a funder investment. If you could turn to the next slide, please. One of the main challenges or, or things we have our eye on in terms of scaling is we have no desire to get big just to get big. We need to make sure that we get big and continue to accelerate and maximize our impact. And one of the challenges we face is how do we make sure that that coach and that team in Houston is as effective as that team in Philadelphia that's closer to HQ? We have new offices now. And one of the challenges that's there is a knowledge management challenge. How do we make sure that our coaches in Houston or Denver have access to the same best material that we used in our validation effort that got us those results, uh, how do they have access to it? So we created this web-based portal called LEARN, or Literacy Education and Resource Network. It's a curated site that you see is focused on the same national reading panel practices that drive our work, and we made it available to the public. So it's now freely available, but it's also the stuff we use. Um, we take a non-proprietary approach. So if you're interested in looking at it, go to learn.cli.org and you'll find the same kinds of tools, materials, videos, and resources that we use in our practice. I'm gonna turn it back over now to Brian. All right, thank you very much, Joel. Um, that was great. Um, let's turn to Lindsay to, um, have her tell us about what they've been doing at Higher Achievement. Thanks so much, Brian and Joel. I am always interested in learning from CLI. Your your growth is really inspiring for me to watch and learn from. Um, so for those of you on the phone who are not familiar with Higher Achievement, I'm going to give you a quick primer on who we are and what we do, and then I'll talk about our randomized control trial study results and how we are approaching scale. Um, so higher achievement is solely focused on the critical middle school transition years in an effort to close a wide opportunity gap, which we believe is what leads to achievement gaps in our country. How we do that is with a high dosage year round multi year after school and summer program. Um, you can see on these graphics here, each of the scholars in our program gets three weekly mentors and on average stays 
for four years in our program from fifth grade through eighth grade. It culminates in placement in college preparatory high schools. And it's replete with opportunities from overnight college trips to um, really intensive mentoring, lots of fun um, academic contests and, and opportunities to share their voice. Next slide, please. There are two things that we believe really differentiate higher achievement. One is culture and the next is rigor. And we'll talk first about culture. Um, this is, I'm actually in our Baltimore staff office right now. We were just talking about how culture plays out at our centers and it's, it really is um, one of the things we believe distinguishes us. The Wallace Foundation recently featured our culture in a, a publication. Um, but we go deep with our families and scholars. Um, we, we build multi-year relationships. Um, we're able to kind of stay with them for four years and so those relationships get stronger and stronger each year. Our scholars are able to build their confidence and share their voices. Um, from sharing their love poetry on the stage of the Kennedy Center to um, debating really meaningful topics um, from gang violence to school reform efforts um, in their schools and, and across our cities with um, adults listening and, and hearing the voices of our scholars. Uh, and lastly, you know, our culture is really intended to build those social emotional uh, skills to help our scholars um, tackle challenges and become the leaders that we know they can be. Next slide, please. One of the other differentiators of higher achievement is rigor. And I mentioned this is high dosage. It, it really is quite significant. It's about 650 hours a year, which total about 100 extra school days that our scholars are spending with us after school and in the summer. Um, we also rigor, we use a rigorous approach to evaluation um, from the randomized control trial study that I'll talk about in a minute to um, monthly KPI dashboards that are driving actions at all of our centers. And lastly, um, the way that we use data across the whole spectrum from um, grades to attendance, but also measuring the impact on our scholars' hope, well-being, and engagement. Next slide, please. So we believe that those differentiating factors of culture and rigor and our year-round multi-year approach is what has led to success in our rigorous evaluation. We started a randomized controlled trial study, um, from what I understand is, is ahead of the curve um, in 2006, um, very intensive study um, over seven years that um, recruited students in three cohorts in 06, 07, 08, and followed each cohort for four years. I'm so grateful for um, the funders listed on the bottom here um, because they took a chance on higher achievement. We were a very small program when we started this. I think we were serving about four schools and had about 250 students. And um, that this research has uh, enabled us to grow. It has absolutely been the catalyst for our scale. Um, you can see sort of in the green arrow the various steps along the way in our study. Um, there were three main reports that were published, a two-year kind of macro report, a four-year um, final report, as well as a summer snapshot um, of just one summer. Um, the four-year final report was published in 2013 by MDRC, and um, you can see um, the math and reading test score results in the chart below. You can see um, Statistical significance um, was greater in math than it was in reading. I'm particularly interested to see how it grew in the fourth year follow-up when most of our scholars were actually out of our hands in um, ninth grade, uh, knowing that our, our program formally ends in eighth grade. Um, <clears throat> the researchers and we have been exploring the reading comprehension, the fact that um, only in the second year did, did it approach statistical significance um, compared to the equally motivated control group. All of those students and families who were not able to attend our higher achievement were just as excited to do this highly intensive program. And um, the researchers pointed out that reading is often something that can be acquired um, through various means, through you know summer reading programs at the library to you know, students really following um, 
summer reading opportunities with their families, um, whereas math is something that takes a lot more intentionality to build. And um, that was what they thought was a main difference between math and reading. It's a fairly common trend across the field as well. Next. So I want to talk a little bit about our growth. You can see um, the, the work we've done in 15 and 16, what is projected for 17, and um, then I hopped over to 2019, which is the last year of our I3 grant. Um, we won a validation grant in um, 2015, started at the beginning of 2015, um, and we're so grateful for this investment. It's been catalytic. Um, we applied to do exactly what our strategic plan um, set us on course to do, and it's um, really exciting when the federal government gets behind your strategic plan with $12 million. So we have we are concentrating our scale in the four cities that we serve. You can see the little map with the, the years that we launched in each of those cities below. <clears throat> and our goal is to serve many more students, almost double the number of students in those four cities by the end of I-3. Um, Importantly to the sustainability point is that we have set a clear goal to each new center that we launch needs to have at least 40% of their full cost covered by non-I3 funds at day one. Um, so we're taking a different approach than CLI um, because I have seen the challenges, at least for an after school and summer program, to um, back into district payment, um, and it's really important that we, um, and also philanthropic payment is much um, more feasible at launch than it is to jump in at year two or three and help sustain. And so um, some of the <clears throat> corporate and foundation partners that have allowed us to propel this growth, um, you can see their logos below, We're really grateful for them and many more. Um, and we do have most of our districts um, supporting those funds um, from the beginning as well. It's been a little bit um, easier in some school districts than others to secure those payments, um, which we may go into in the question and answer. Um, I wanted to point out also our um, goal around influencing students by the end of this grant. We are seeking um, to distill elements of higher achievement that can be um, shared much more broadly in uh, through an influence strategy for indirect um, impact on these students. And we're in working very closely um, to what I've been calling quantify our intuition about what works in our program. And RCT shows you that your program in its entirety works. And we've been um, working closely to kind of refine elements of our program and um, examine ways that we could scale that bigger. <clears throat> in addition to the very dramatic scale plan of um, reaching 1,900 scholars in our four cities with our very intensive program by 2019. I will say the last thing around growth and sustainability is that we have taken um, a very um, analytical approach to how we are examining our cost per scholar, per impact. And um, it is a concept that's um, easy to say and harder to achieve. And so we are looking at um, very carefully um, examining the cost for each of our centers as it relates to um, their academic performance and also um, their social emotional skill development. And that is um, helping us advance our uh, next strategic plan, which will take us um, into the years beyond this I-3 investment. And that's it. I'll turn it back to Brian. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Joel and, and Lindsay, just want to ask you a couple of questions before we turn to Tom. Now, both of you had, before you got your I-3 grant, had some experience working with at least a limited number of implementation sites. I think you said, Lindsay, you were only working in four schools with a relatively small number of students. And I'm sure you were able to offer some, some rather uh, uh, close support um, for those for those sites that you were working with at that point. But when you got the I-3 grant and you had the task of scaling larger, I guess what I'm interested in learning is is how you uh, 
chose your your strategy for scaling, how you um, determined um, the best way to to go about adding new sites in a more geographically dispersed um, group of of locations, and how you needed to change your program or or your or your your uh, approach to supporting those places um, with the uh, with this new task in mind. Joel, maybe you could start by answering that question. Sure. Uh, a number of questions in there. Uh, the first, we had criteria by which we went around geographic expansion. Um, so for the scale up, um, they included obviously school districts with um, high percentage of schools in need. A critical draw for us was we wanted districts that had higher concentration of English language learners than was the national average. We want to back ourselves into a corner so that we make sure that we are on the cutting edge of the support that we need to provide to students given the dem demographic shifts. We wanted to make sure that the districts we selected had the same priority, had a publicly stated priority of making sure kids can read and write by third and we're taking a similar approach, um, a balanced literacy approach. Um, in terms of other aspects of scaling, we didn't believe that we could take what we did in Camden or Chicago, airlift it into Houston or Broward County and say implement this program. We just don't think that change management and scaling works like that. That's why we really took this local education as a local sport mentality. and. Part of our work is raising teams in those new districts um, and having the management support and training to support them to not only do the service delivery work, make sure that it's high quality implementation, but really a lot around building relationships. Um, if we're going to tailor our work to the local context, that means we need to deeply know the local context and use the same language as the district and be at the table when they're talking about their literacy plan so we can align to what they're doing rather than providing yet another message to teachers that's different than what the district is trying to provide. So we, you know, it's, we're, we're trying to find the right balance between supporting a local context and standardizing across a larger footprint. What needs to be the same and what needs to be really tailored and that, that really guides our thinking. Lindsay, I want to put the, more or less the same question to you. How did you des decide how you were going to approach the process of scaling and what did you need to do differently? Sure. Um, I just want to um, underscore what Joel said around local context. It's something um, that's really important um, to be impactful in different communities. Um, and one way that we have been going about um, figuring out where in the pendulum we need to be from highly rigid to um, so flexible that you don't know what it is <laughs> um, and there's no consistency, I think there's, uh, that pendulum is sometimes swinging as you scale. And um, over this past year, we have really focused on this concept that we actually borrowed from our friends at Bell um, that is, um, fixed, like really identifying what is fixed about our model, what can be flexible, and what is fixed flexible. So you have like choices within um, a, a specific set. <clears throat> and um, that is something that we started with our program model and we've gone through great, great detail on. Um, and that is underscoring all, and uh, undergirding all of our um, trainings and materials um, that are uh, reinforcing what is fixed and then um, learning from where there's flexibility and, and maybe something that starts off as a, a local innovation that isn't something that we have prioritized to be fixed may become a standard best practice that we, um, that we share across all of the cities. Um, and while it started in our program, we've started to now use that fixed flexible framework across the non-program elements of our work um, on, you know, our communications work, the way we are uh, raising funds, um, how we are um, in 
uh, sort of advancing professional development of our staff. Um, there's lot there, we've used that framework across um, lots of areas of our work, both program and administrative. Um, the other thing that I think we've, we've done a, a deep investment in um, that's important for us as far as um, producing outcomes is to get much clearer about how we leverage our human capital. And um, we just finished a, a deep engagement a, a, about a year ago um, that helped us really refine the core competencies of staff regardless of position and <clears throat> create proficiency scales for each of those and then trainings um, to help people grow within the core competencies. Um, and those core competencies are now used in um, hiring and screening employees, managing and coaching employees, um, you know, addressing performance challenges, um, giving shout outs and praise. Um, they, are, they are really um, helping us be more precise about the human element of this work. And at the end of the day, this is all about people interacting with each other and um, especially in higher achievements model when we're so intentional about culture, um, it really has been paying off. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and ask you about recruitment. I know as a program officer, I have um, witnessed that some of our, our projects who are trying to scale have had some difficulty or have sometimes underestimated the difficulty of actually recruiting districts to adopt their practices. I, I wonder if you could comment on um, what you found to work in, in getting districts to commit and to, uh, to engage their energies in, in taking on your project. Joel, maybe we could start with you. Sure, I talked a little bit about that uh, up front. Getting district engagement is a huge focus. So just from a real nuts and bolts, I'll give you a, a brief overview of a timeline. Uh, as soon as we knew that we were going to apply for the, the scale-up grant, we began going around to different potential districts to say, we're going to apply to this. We don't know if we're going to get it. Here's the program design. We think you'd be a great candidate. Are you interested? What do you need to know? How do we make you an informed consumer? Through relationships and also um, being able to point to our past results, which was extraordinarily helpful, we actually didn't find it very hard to find districts that were interested in partnering with us. So, but that's, that's just a first step. What we didn't want to have happen then was to then go to implement in schools that didn't know anything about us. So it's both a district level issue, but it's a very much a school and teacher level issue in order to get an initiative off to the right, off on the right foot. So we did get district level MOUs signed and then applied. But once we got the grant, we did what we call a discovery phase where we went back to the districts and said, hey, assistant soups, first of all, remember us, here's what's involved in this initiative. What do you need to know to be then advocates to eligible schools and principals to say, here's this opportunity. We did principal sessions and literacy leader sessions informing them of what's involved in participating. And we created a really mild application process where then principals went back to their teachers and said, here's what's involved. They didn't need to get teachers to vote. We didn't have any threshold like that. But they knew it was in their best interest to bring teachers on board before they threw their hat in the ring. Once we had schools on board, we put them in a pile and then off they went to our evaluator for selection and randomization. So it was a long and involved process to bring folk, folks from the district to the school on board. Thanks. Lindsay, what did you, what, what did you find worked for, for you for recruitment? Sure. Um, so we have a lot of interest um, for expansion we have had for a while. Um, and so the way that we approached it, we were um, primarily not looking to new districts, although we did move to one additional district in um, just outside the city of Richmond. Um, we sh put together sort of an RFP of sorts um, for potential school partners and um, those school leaders 
responded to our local executive directors. And in many cases, we had, um, you know, three or four schools that were interested. Um, and each of our executive directors kind of synthesized the schools that were interested in their cities and then came to our national board retreat and essentially pitched the opportunities that they had. Our board members had a scoring rubric across, um, you know, what we believed were the criteria for success. And, um, and then we made decisions on um, which centers we could open. Uh, and we ended up opening four centers across um, our four cities last year. And um, we did expand, as I mentioned, to one new district, which was um, Henrico County outside of Richmond. And they um, were a, a very, um, a close partner we had been talking with for a while. And they um, really um, were great to work with. I will say the one challenge we've had in a few of our districts using that approach was um, the IRB process has been trickier because um, we engaged in some cases at the school level and, and only in certain sections of the district. You know, it might be the school turnaround office or the superintendent for middle schools, but not um, as much in the research office until after we were starting to move. And um, in some cases, the IRB process has been um, lengthy to get the reviews that we needed to do for um, to do the randomized control trial study that's part of this work. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to shift now to Tom. And to, oh, you've heard from um, from uh, people on the ground doing this work. Tom uh, is going to tell us about what he learned generally by canvassing uh, a number of the I3 grantees working on scale up, and, and we'll share some sort of general analysis. Tom? Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Joel and Lindsay. Um, we and my colleagues at WestDOT and at EDC are very thankful to have had the opportunity to have conversations with these nine I3 grantees who collectively are serving over 1.2 million students through their I3 funded efforts. You can see on the screen that the organizations rep have represented all three levels of the I3 funding that, that Brian described earlier, from developing an intervention to validating it in across different contexts to scaling it up at a national level. To gather information for the paper, we researched the public record on each organization and then conducted conversations with each about their experiences, covering questions about their approach to scaling up, their successes and challenges, the impact on funding on their efforts, the evidence of their intervention impact, site recruitment, training and coaching, and their business model. So really delving into the full spectrum of their organization and intervention. The strategies identified through the conversations are not exhaustive, but they should be useful to any organization scaling up their practice in education. So for the purpose of the paper and the conversation with grantees, uh, we use Cynthia Coburn's definition of the term scaling up, ultimately to achieve deep and lasting change. Dr. Coburn in her 2003 paper identified the four dimensions, uh, definitions of scaling up that you see on the screen. So first is really the, the focus that Joel mentioned, getting to that depth of change in practice within the classroom. Secondly, thinking about sustainability of, of both the practices but also the impacts through inevitable implementation dips and beyond. Third is around spreading beyond just a particular practice but really getting into the beliefs and norms about how education is done in local communities. And then lastly, um, shifting ownership uh, of, of an effort or an intervention from a uh, partner down into the local schools and communities to drive both innovation and to shape and, and sustain the work. So these four aspects are very much aligned to the intent and focus of the I3 grantees. You heard those these concepts reflected in, in, uh, in Joel and Lindsay's comments. And they served, again, as the foundation for our discussions with grantees. So while each organization did take, of course, different paths to getting to scale, there were some shared lessons that are captured in the white paper Brian mentioned. Uh, we do provide more depth and examples around each of these four uh, lessons and strategies, but I will spend a few minutes today talking about each in turn and sharing an example or two of a grantee. So first, to establish buy-in and get to the depth of change and ownership, grantees use multiple methods. 
leveraging evidence of effectiveness from research studies, as well as powerful anecdotes of student impact. As one example, Success for All for the last 30 years has worked directly with educators in thousands of schools in disadvantaged communities to help students achieve reading levels at or above the norm. Success for All dedicates as much as six to nine months up front to seek buy-in from teachers before implementing the intervention in a school. Success for All does not have a large marketing budget like a publishing company, so it relies heavily on word of mouth and previous relationships as a starting point for their recruitment. Through, though the formal research can be helpful in starting the conversation, as you've heard from both Joel and Lindsay, Success for All also found that speaking beyond the academics and connecting to the heart by telling stories of the intervention's effects on students and educators is essential to establishing that buy-in and commitment. Success for All and other organizations have also found it essential to support partners in identifying new and repurposing existing funding to support implementation. The second strategy is focused around a regional and national infrastructure, and this gets at the kind of fixed flexible and fixed flexible framework that Lindsay was uh, speaking to. To support implementation, build capacity, ensure integrity of the intervention, and support the flexibility to adapt to that local context and need, organizations build both a national and regional infrastructure, delineating those clear roles and responsibilities. So generally, organizations built geographic concentrations of local resources and expertise. Uh, there was a question in the chat box. I'll just uh, uh, take a moment to say that organizations have defined these regions in a lot of different uh, ways. Uh, one of the recent scale-up grantees has defined the Northeast as a region. Uh, and to some extent, it's really around how many schools um, and districts you tend to partner with. Uh, KIPP has regions uh, that are both urban, urban, rural, and rural across the country. So as another example around building a national and regional infrastructure, the National Math and Science Institute, or NMSI, supports states, districts, and schools to improve student access and success in advanced coursework in math and science. NMSI is the recipient of two I3 awards. In their first award, which was a validation grant, they used a local partnership model to scale up in 40 districts across two states. In fact, I believe one of the local partners is on the call today. They did this by partnering with the local nonprofits and universities to lead implementation, and NMSI was able to concentrate and leverage that local infrastructure for quick implementation. When NMSI received a scale-up grant for further expansion in 2015, they decided to directly establish staff in local communities across nine districts to reach 60,000 students, similarly approach that Joel and Lindsay have taken. They made this adjustment to have more direct control over program implementation and support, including the hiring of staff, coordination of student and teacher training and mentoring, collection and analysis of participant feedback, partnerships, and fundraising. The third strategy is one that's well, well known to I3 grantees. It's around adapting practice based on evidence. With the investment in, uh, of I3 in independent evaluations, grantees are focused on evidence both of project implementation and of student impact. Organizations uh, that we spoke with incorporate their own and other new research in the field into their practices, solicit and listen to feedback from school-level practitioners to continuously innovate, and conduct deliberate experiments with aspects of the intervention to understand the primary drivers of student success. As one example, Building Assets Reducing Risks, or BAR, is a comprehensive approach to meeting students' academic, social, and emotional needs. The model helps educators build safe, strong, trusting relationships with their students, paving the way for every student to engage in learning. BAR is the only innovation to receive all three levels of I3 funding. During their development grant, BAR realized it took three years, not one, as originally designed to maximize implementation effects in schools. As part of its valid, subsequent validation grant, BAR routinely assessed implementation progress and outcomes using that three-year tiered model. They learned that implementation of some components could begin in the second or third year based on local context. In fact, they found that four of their eight components of the intervention are most important to get in place early, creating cohorts of students in their ninth grades, conducting team review meetings, risk review meetings, and using their iTime curriculum to build relationships among teachers and students. 
and BAR will expand these learnings to 116 more schools with its current 2016 I3 scale-up grant. And then lastly, but uh, equally as important, uh, strategy four is planning for sustainability from day one. And organizations uh, are, try are proactive about how they will fund this, both the scale-up of the intervention, but also leverage relationships and partnerships to sustain implementation and maintain the effect on student achievement. As Lindsay mentioned, when you get $12 million behind your effort from the federal government, there's a question of what happens when that money dries up. So a proactive approach is a challenge for many organizations, but does require consideration before and during implementation. Integrating predictable, many times public, funding for sustainability, identifying that large predictable funding for scaling up that allows you to focus on getting the intervention and impact right, and adjusting implementation support after that initial push are three key parts of the strategy. I'm going to mention three briefly, and then we'll turn it back to Brian for uh, further discussion. You heard from Children's Literacy Initiative and Joel that uh, they build kind of a habit of mind uh, that things cost when they go to partner with districts and are using their funds as seed, fund, seed funding. Uh, Joel and his team have structured the per pupil costs or the per school costs. Uh, of implementation to taper significantly after year one to aid in sustainability. And additionally, the schools contribute uh, $10,000 per year for each year of implementation. You also heard from Lindsay and Higher Achievement speaking about the regional approach to diverse, diversifying funds um, and getting skin in the game at the beginning from both districts and private dollars. I'll share one other example. Um, over the past 30 years, Reading Recovery has maintained about 20 university training centers across the country and they've weathered periods of contraction and expansion, serving more than 2 million elementary school students. Before the I3 grant, Reading Recovery had been scaling up in waves, with the first national expansion happening in the 1980s through the National Diffusion Network. With I3, the Ohio State University and Reading Recovery Partners established a collective goal of expansion and impact as part of the network, expanding services to 380,000 more students within existing and new schools. So Brian, I'll uh, turn it back to you, and I think we've got some time for further discussion. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, those of you who have questions, please use the chat box to uh, send them in. We've got some already, and I'm going to uh, um, share uh, the first of these with uh, Lindsay. Lindsay, in your, your uh, talk, you discuss the importance of the uh, contributions you got from a variety of private organizations in addition to the I3 dollars. And the question was, what was the motivation of those organizations to contribute? Um, was it uh, the promise of skilled employees or, um, you know, for, for local companies or, or did they see it as a civic responsibility? What, what exactly was their interest? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question, and it um, so thank you for it. The it relates to um, sort of how we are trying to treat partnerships much more strategically than we used to um, years ago. In the past, we would look to corporate and philanthropic partners mainly as providers of cash to accomplish our mission. Uh, I think we we have broadened the way that we partner now um, to really ask a lot of questions and, and try to determine if there's um, a mutually beneficial opportunity here. And so particularly with corporate partners, uh, many of them have become really focused on corporate social responsibility. There's um, a growing thirst from um, their younger employees in particular, but employees of all ages for um, volunteer engagement that's, that's meaningful. Um, we have as an organization figured out ways to um, have, obviously we've always had the weekly mentoring volunteer opportunity, which is the highest and best use of mentors, um, but we also have one-time volunteer events that are a great opportunity for companies to get engaged. And many of these companies um, got engaged through sort of one-time volunteer events and we were able to follow up and cultivate them into um, financial supporters as well as um, what we've targeted, we've targeted them as sponsors of particular schools and centers, and then they often send 10 to 12 of their employees to be weekly mentors, which um, accrues benefits back 
to the company in terms of employee morale, employee retention, um, this kind of esprit de corps that comes with volunteering together. Um, and uh, then several of our um, foundation partners um, have a, a very clear interest in the work of middle school and out of school time and youth development. And we've been um, facilitating and benefiting from their generosity of, um, of funds as well as um, the extraordinary sort of um, information and um, strategy that they're able to accrue from many of their grantees um, over the years. And then when this I3 opportunity came forward, they, many of them were excited to support that growth um, as match funders as well as funders of our evolving influence strategy. So um, they kind of come in two buckets and each one of the companies, um, there's an individual story for how they got engaged, which I'm happy to go offline with, but it, um, it has been um, a really exciting way to engage um, across sectors, uh, corporate, philanthropic, and government. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I want to uh, turn over to Joel and have him uh, address the question that we received for him about um, his reference to the use of I3 funding as seed money. Um, we had the question, the questioner asked to hear more about the actual mechanisms, institutional or otherwise, that uh, were used to cement the relationships for scaling and sustainability. It was a little bit like, listen, we've got all this food for the buffet. Do you want to come to lunch? Uh, you know, it, it's, I don't know that we had formalized mechanisms. There were some prior relationships, so I knew some of the chief academic officers um, or had connections to them. I spent a lot of time in meetings talking about what we do and most especially the results that we had. And I think it was about building trust and having resources, potential resources, to pilot an initiative. And I really framed it as, listen, we want to support, I'm here because we know about your priorities and we want to support you to realize them in terms of student learning outcomes. If we, uh, if, if you value the approach we take and we're aligned, we have an opportunity now to work together to create a pilot. And then this funded pilot can then be your basis for evidence whether you want to expand it or not. It'll give you some time to get to know us and how we work and build those relationships. And if we get results, great, then we'll expand. And if we don't, that's not good, obviously, and you shouldn't expand. Um, so that, that was the general approach. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Tom, I'm going to turn to you. You sort of answered, uh, gave us at least a short answer to this question online, but I'd, I'd like, uh, like you to take a stab on it orally here. Um, the question was about available resources uh, or models that might be out there that people could um, look to if they needed some help. And, and, thinking through scale-out processes themselves. Uh, do you know of, uh, of any places where you might refer them to? I do, Brian, um, and I think I'll, uh, I don't want to, so, so in our research, uh, to be frank, there's, there's, not, um, there's not a wealth of, of research around scaling up practices within education. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the I3 program was, was obviously created. Um, but but there is a nonprofit org consulting organization that I've, whose resources I've, I've um, found really helpful and grantees have as well. Um, and uh, I guess I'll mention them. So it's Bridgespan based in uh, Boston. They're one of, one of their um, key uh, articles is uh, referenced in this paper. Um, there's also a, a, a book that we've highlighted within the I3 community released by two Stanford professors who spent six years looking at um, effective change management practices for scaling up education, um, educational efforts they draw from business and other sectors. Um, and that's called Scaling Up Excellence. Um, th that's also in the references. So those, those are two that are really helpful. For I3 grantees, we've distilled some of those into some 
uh, workshop and resources. So I'm happy to share those for any AI through guarantees that are on the line. Um, but uh, so that's, those are good places to start. I think uh, there's a lot of research around scaling up healthcare efforts. Um, the Gates Foundation has been very vocal about and, and um, uh, contributory to the national, international scaling up efforts of immunization and other practices. So I think healthcare is an interesting place to look and, and frankly just um, startup, uh, startup uh, companies on the, in the kind of private business sector is another place that we've started to, to draw some lessons. The only thing other I, else I would say is um, an article that came out maybe a year or so ago in um, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, which is called What's Your End Game? And um, it goes through five or six models about when you're scaling, being clear about what you're, what were you're, where you're aiming. Are you aiming for public sector adoption? Are you aiming for um, some kind of technology innovation. That, what, what is the what's your end game? I would recognize. I would recommend reading that article. Thank you. I, I think we we only have time for one more quick question, and I, I actually wanted to pose it to Lindsay. You you talked a bit about um, some of the issues that you. Um, well, financial issues, your financial model issues. I, w I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that again. Could you talk about the importance of of identifying a clear, logical financial model um, to the scaling process? Absolutely, yeah. So um, I think I shared this with Tom in my interview for the report, that um, when we um, got the email that we were a highest rated applicant for I3, um, I celebrated and we as a staff and board celebrated for maybe three hours and then started thinking about 2020 when this grant ends um, because it's, it's a major infusion of cash that we need to make sure that we're very careful about. So um, we had had a plan in, in the proposal, um, but then once it was awarded, it, it became real. So our intention is to, um, in, with each of the new centers that we um, open at a school, that 40% of the launch dollars are provided by non-I3 sources, um, private, um, public from, you know, 21st century funds to, you know, discretionary funds that schools and districts have um, to city-based funds um, to um, corporate and philanthropic dollars. Um, and the intention is that those um, funds have the potential to um, scale as we serve more center and more students at that center and um, to be elastic over time. At the same time, we are raising dollars um, from um, nationally from foundations and some organizations, uh, some companies that have a multi-city footprint um, to support the influence work that we're doing that could have a broader um, range about our sort of geographic spread of impact. And, um, and then we're very closely monitoring the cost per scholar per impact. And the way that we have um, been kind of infusing that into our daily practice is through um, this, what we call the bubble chart. Um, you may have seen these in, in different reports where um, there's two axes, and for us, it's, it's overly simplified, but you know, math grades are on one axis and reading grades on the other axis, and all 18 of our centers have a bubble, and the size of the bubble relates to how expensive, what the cost per scholar is at that site. And the cost per scholar is driven obviously by the direct cost, but also about how many students are attending on a regular basis. And so, um, it, you know, at times you have a, um, I remember one very specific sort of Jupiter, a very big bubble in our constellation um, that wasn't achieving our outcomes. It was in the lower quadrant. And that is a very helpful management tool for us to then zero in what's, what's happening in that center. How do we make sure that um, the program is coming to life and that we're serving more students um, and maximizing the dollars in that center? And um, I'm grateful to say that that has moved from the lower left quadrant to the upper right quadrant, and the bubble's getting smaller. It's not quite as small as we'd like it to be. It's not quite as efficient as as we'd like it to be, but it, it is a way of just constantly, month after month, managing our cost effectiveness um, 
and our program effectiveness in tandem and making that like the financial information transparent to our program staff who actually have a lot of control over that cost per scholar. Um, and that was a, a more of a radical way for us to think about um, managing finances that used to be kind of segregated, just the finance department and executive staff used to look at finances, but now it's much more transparent and we're able to, um, to be much more nimble in how we maximize the precious dollars that we have. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, we're just past the two o'clock and we promised to end at two, so I, uh, there's a whole lot of issues that we could continue talking about, but I'm afraid we don't have time. So I wanna thank those of you uh, uh, who served on the panel, Joel, Lindsay, and Tom, and uh, thank all of you who uh, registered and, uh, and, and listened to us today. Really appreciate your interest. Um, I believe we will be posting this webinar on the i3community.ed.gov website. I would encourage you to uh, check, the, uh, check this out and the other resources that are available there about i3 and uh, the work that's being done by the i3 grantees. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.